Service started up a little upbeat. If you want to clap your hand, Pastor's been talking about worship and just giving it all to him. So feel free to do whatever you want to do. If you want to dance, you want to tap your hand, you want to tap your foot, let's, let's do it.
God, we just thank you for this day and the spirit in this place. God, and we just ask that you would, would be with this offering, God, as it's taken up. God, that we would give with cheerful hearts. And God, that we would give you what you want us to give, God. We just ask that you would be with this service, be with the rest of the time that we're here, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we're going to do a, a new song for you this morning. And I'm sure some of you guys have heard it, but how many of you this morning are just overwhelmed with life sometimes. Sometimes we just try so hard and instead of just looking to him for the work he's already done, we just try so hard ourselves to just worry and try to do everything on our own. But all we should be doing is looking to him for that. So this song talks a little bit about that, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. Spinning a heaven 
are beautiful, oh God. There is no one more beautiful. You are beautiful. God, you are the most beautiful. Yes, He is. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Oh God, there is no one more wonderful. You are wonderful. God, you are the most wonderful. You are glorious. You are glorious. You are glorious. Oh God, there is no one more glorious. You are glorious. God, you are the most glorious. Cause I can lay myself in you. In the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. Cause God, I run into your arms. I'm a sheep because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. Amen. Give him a hand this morning. You may be seated. This morning, I'm going to sing um, a special song this morning that um, really just speaks to me. And um, it's a song, I think it originally was a song that maybe a Southern Gospel group did. And a new group called Finding Favor has redone this song. And um, it just talks about the things in life that we've been through and that he's brought us through. And through those times, all we can say is say amen. And I pray this morning that as I sing this song, that you, it will speak to you like it did to me. Anybody here who's seen this power? Anybody here 
Christian ministry, I've had several personal aspirations, as well as a number of congregational goals, and some of them better than others. However, looking back and speaking about those 35 years of pursuing those, I have only one for myself and for the congregation, the church that I serve. Here it is to simply be a follower of Jesus Christ. Being a better follower of Christ and making more followers is how that I want to spend the remainder of my days and it's what I want to use, what influence I have to bring about. We as a church know where we are going to be like Jesus and helping others And I might even add, as helping as many as we can be like Jesus. We know how to get there. Worshiping higher, believing greater, surrendering deeper, and reaching farther. If the quality and the character and traits of Jesus is to be lived out in us, then believing greater is a challenge that we must embrace as well as worshiping higher. Hopefully, after the last series, the worship in the church gets higher. After this series, prayerfully, the believing in this church gets greater. So let's talk about believing greater for the next couple to three weeks. Just as God the Father seeks worshipers who worship in spirit and truth, Know this, Jesus marvels at faith that is greater than our circumstance. Jesus marvels at faith that is greater than our circumstance. According to Leon Morris, there are only two things in the gospel that cause Christ to marvel, belief and unbelief. Both Matthew and Luke writes that Christ marveled at the centurion's faith. I'll read it in Matthew first. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Mark writes Jesus speaking about his hometown Nazareth in the sixth chapter and the fifth verse. And he could there do no mighty work 
save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and he healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. Now there were several times the crowd marveled at what Jesus said and what he did. The disciples marveled that Jesus would talk to certain people. There were times that Jesus recognized the astonishment on people's face. He recognized the amazement in their countenance and he said to them, marvel not at this. There is at least one occasion that Jesus said to a woman, at least one occasion, that he said to this woman, thy faith is great, but only belief and unbelief cause Christ to marvel. Other translations use the word astonished or amazed. The message says that Jesus was taken back by the centurion's faith. The message says that Jesus couldn't get over the unbelief of the people in Nazareth. Now this word this uh, for marvel, the Greek word is thaumadzo. And it means to admire, to pay regard to. Now, you might admire someone or something about them by acknowledging them or paying a compliment. But this word thaumadzo is much deeper than a compliment or a simple recognition. The reason that we know this is Jesus recognized many and he paid several compliments, but he marveled at one man's faith. He complimented the woman who poured out the perfume on his feet. He complimented Peter for his great confession. He recognized the faith of four men who removed a roof to get their friends in the house where Jesus was. And on and on the list goes. Jesus was generous with compliments and he frequently recognized people. But only was he astonished, only was he amazed, only was he thaumadzo of the faith of the non-Jewish centurion. And only was he amazed at the unbelief of the people who knew him, saw him grow up in his hometown of Nazareth. Interesting, interesting. Would Jesus marvel at our faith if we said, bring the sick that medicine cannot cure to the church? Would he be amazed at our faith if we said, bring the emotional oppressed to us that the therapist cannot cure? Would Jesus marvel of our faith if we said, bring the addicted to the body of Christ that rehab cannot rehabilitate? Would Jesus marvel at our faith if we said, bring the heartbroken and the hurting and the helpless to us that are not finding hope in other places. Oh, I think he would recognize it. I think he would acknowledge it. But I'm not sure that he would be amazed by it. Speaking of these four men that I mentioned earlier that removed the roof of a house so that they could get their paralyzed friend to Jesus, listen to what Mark writes. When Jesus saw their faith, they had great faith. They had they had great faith and he saw their faith and he said to the paralytic take your bed and go to your house now don't misunderstand me never underestimate that remarkable great faith will accomplish for others as well as yourself because it will but I'm wondering if what Jesus says about this centurion doesn't even exceed beyond great or remarkable what is the faith that amazes and astonishes Jesus, or to quote the message, what is the faith that takes him back? Now, it takes a lot to take back God the Son, amen? But the faith of the centurion took Jesus back. He was astonished, he was amazed, he marveled at it. Pamela Reeve writes this, and I quote, Faith is resting in the fact that God has an objective in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to him and a burden to others. Wow, let me say that again. 
Faith is resting in the fact that God has an objective in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to him and a burden to others. She also writes, and I quote, Faith is engaging in the deepest joy of heaven. Listen, knowing his unfathomable love for me as I walk through the thorny, desolate now. When we see miracles, we are at awe at what happens. But when I see someone who remains faithful to Christ while their circumstances has pushed them to live for a span of time on the edge of despair, I am amazed at their faith to hold steady. I'm amazed at the people who don't wait for the storm to pass, but they dance in the rain. Amen and amen. I'm amazed at people when their circumstances push them to the edge of despair and they embrace the spot knowing the longer they're there, the more into the image of Christ that they become. When I see people like that, I am amazed at their faith. And I have seen some of you like that and your faith has amazed me. It has challenged me. It has encouraged me. As amazing as all of those things are, I still believe there's something that Jesus saw in the centurion's faith that caused him to marvel. Luke chapter 7, let's read. Would you stand on your feet for the reading of the word of the Lord? Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, that meaning the elders, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one of whom he should do this for was deserving. For he loves our nation and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, underline the word Lord, highlight the word Lord, it's key to this. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. Now notice this. I'm a man that is acquainted with being under authority, but I am also a man that is familiar with having authority. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turned around and said to the crowd that followed, I say to you that I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. God bless you. You may be seated. Quickly, quickly. There is three things about the centurion that I want to point out that I believe was instrumental in Jesus marveling at this man's faith or this man's faith causing Jesus to marvel. The first one is this. He had an an amazing approach to his king. Luke gives us the account of the elders of the Jews that I read seeking to impress upon Jesus the worthiness of the centurion. However, Matthew doesn't bother with these specific details. You see, the centurion himself pleaded no merit. He takes the position of utter unworthiness. He emphasizes this by insisting that Jesus shouldn't come to his house. He says, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. I'm not worthy to make this request from you for you to do this. You see, I have a feeling that this guy didn't live in a dilapidated shack on the other side of the tracks. Amen? What do you think? You see, I'm not sure, but I think the quality of his dwelling would be very significant. But when you consider the fact that he was a high-ranking official, an officer in the Roman army, he probably had pretty high living quarters. 
Then he had servants and, and, and all that goes with that. So you kind of get the idea. However, when you're talking to the king of glory, no house, no place, no palace is adequate for his presence. That is crucial. That is crucial when you are approaching the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't care how much good stuff you bring, you better come unworthy of the presence of the King of Glory. It's an amazing approach that this man had to the King. Do you ever think that we might have forgotten who we are? And who he is, again, let me remind you, every time we take the Lord's Supper in this place, every time we pass communion, it is a reminder of who he is and what he did and who we are. So don't grab the, 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 the juice and the, and, the, and the cup if you're fortunate to have something put in your cup, as some of you know that you weren't. Uh, but, but don't grab that and just very nonchalant, just pause, just ponder. We do this in remembrance of him. We do this to remember who we were and who we are and how we got there because of who he is. And I would just say to you today, this man, this man had an amazing approach to the king of glory. Yes, in Christ we have covenant rights to the blessings of God that flow from his throne. Yes, at, as we request those, we need to do so with a deep sense of unworthiness. What is so amazing about the high-ranking official's approach is in life, to get what you're going after, you do have to sell yourself. You see, that is what the elders were trying to do. If you look at this, they were trying to sell Jesus as to why that he should grant the centurion's request. This sell yourself approach is especially true in the day that we live. And I'm not suggesting that we can, that, that we can make it in our culture without it. Some may call this putting your best foot forward, but that approach doesn't work with Jesus. He says, whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Yes, I think you may want to come across confident and self-assuring with your co-workers and your boss, but don't bother with God. Amen? Unworthiness is how to approach the king of glory. And that's how this man did, even though he was a high-ranking official. The second thing I notice about this man is he had an amazing regard for his fellow man. And I've read this and I won't read it again. He's not requesting healing for himself. He's not asking for a miracle for a family member or an associate or an acquaintance of equal status. This is a slave. And as I came across that, I wonder how many other slaves that he had. And I wonder how many more that he had access to. But that didn't matter. This army, army officer is very wealthy, very powerful, yet he is very humane. We might say that he cares about the least of these. And Jesus says, when you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. His slave was very sick at the point of death. And he was dear to the centurion. This word dear uh, means he honored his servant. He esteemed him. Now listen closely. Don't miss this. If you want a faith that marvels, if you want a belief system that causes God to be amazed and to be astonished. Value people. Value people even those that you may think has a lesser status than you do. Value people. Put a high value on every head. And I do mean on every head. Put a high value on every person, whether they are a child or whether they are a senior whether they are in poverty or whether they live in a palace. Put a high value on every head because that is a belief system that God marvels at. Now think about this. Here is a high-ranking officer 
a high-ranking officer who has an enormous value and has an enormous sense of humanitarian about him. So we have this officer who is high-ranking, yet he values the servant in his house, the one who draws his water. I'm reminded of a story that I heard once as President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy was walking through a cemetery, and you may have read this and heard this story, walking through a cemetery and and they read the epitaph Ronald Reagan did upon one of the individuals who had deceased and was buried there. And the epitaph read this. An honest man, a politician. And Ronald Reagan turned to his wife Nancy and said, Honey, how did they get two different people in that grave? No, I'm looking. Here is, so for all of us, so, so anybody that is, a, that anybody that is an, a, a politician, um, forgive me on that one. But here is a man that has enormous authority, high ranking, and I'll use this term, very well to do, very prestigious. But he has an amazing value for the servant in his house. And again, I say to you, Jesus is impressed with a belief system. He is amazed at a belief system that values greatly the lives of others. The third thing, he had an amazing conviction for authority. And this is what I want us to wrap this up on. The centurion had never met Jesus, never seen Jesus, only heard about him. Yet he had formed an amazing opinion about his power and his ability. His high place on the scale of authority. He knew who he was talking to and believed strongly that Jesus' words were more than adequate to affect the healing and the cure that he was requesting. Perhaps the centurion had heard that Jesus spoke to demons and they left. Perhaps he had heard that Jesus spoke to storms and they calmed. Perhaps he had heard that Jesus spoke to lepers and they were cleansed. Perhaps he had heard that Jesus spoke to disease and it was gone. And because he had heard those things and he heard of those incidents and probably others, he believed that all Jesus had to do was speak to the sickness of his servant and he would be healed. Now, the man illustrates from his own experience, how authority worked. As a commanding officer, he said, I can send word through the proper channels for men to do this, and they will do it. And I can tell them to go, and they will go. And I don't even need to be present. Watch this. I don't even need to be present to make the command, but it is carried out just as if I was. Now you know what he's doing. Now you know what he is up to. That's why he says, I don't even, Lord, I didn't have to come. I didn't have to come. You don't need to come. I didn't come to you because I was unworthy. I'm unworthy. You don't need to come to my house because all you have to do. I know how authority works. I'm a man, he says in here, I am a man who has authority, but don't miss this. I am a man who is under authority. Now, listen very closely. The centurion was a man of authority. He was a man under authority. The man didn't just speak of the authority that he had, but as well he mentions that he has this conviction that is strong for those who have authority over him. You see, here's something you need to know. Often people who have authority do not easily easily accept the fact that they are under authority, but this man did, and Jesus is impressed. And it is not only that he is under authority, he acknowledges that he is under the personification of authority. His comments that brings amazement to Jesus isn't because he acknowledges that his men do what he says of his authority. Jesus is amazed that the man's comments acknowledge that he, meaning Jesus, has authority over the centurion. And it's in the sixth verse. I told you to underline it. It is the word, Lord. Here's something interesting that I mentioned this morning to some of our guys as we were praying. Here's something interesting I would encourage you to do. It's interesting to me, and I'm almost sure that I'm correct on this, but this is your homework for this week uh, to prove this either is, is this either true or false. 
Okay? Is it true that the English word Lord, the English word that we the word that we use, Lord is the most frequent used word in the entire Bible? Now, I think it's true, but you can check it out this week and you can count all of the times that the word Lord is in the Bible. Good luck. It's 22 pages in Strong's Concordance, okay? Interesting. Interesting. I find it quite interesting. Not love? Hmm? Not, not love? Uh, I, not even the preposition it or... Uh, no, no. Lord. By using the word Lord, the centurion communicates an, an amazing belief system. You see, it doesn't matter which gospel you read, both Matthew and Luke write this man of great authority referencing Jesus as Lord. Jesus, Jesus marvels at this man, a Gentile, with such strong conviction that Christ was his Lord, his master, his owner, the one whose authority he submitted to completely. The centurion says, Lord, I know how authority works, and all you need to do is speak to the sickness of my servant, and it will be healed. I know what kind of authority you have. Let me just remind you this morning, when we talk about believing greater when we talk about believing greater, and we're getting ready here in a